Before we get into this episode of Clinically Pressed, we wanted to just remind you if you're in the lacrosse area, uh, we are hosting this Youth Sports Safety Symposium October 12th uh, down at the Radisson. That's coming up in about a month. Please check in the show notes or in the description for the link to sign up and make it to that. Along with that, we'll have Youth Sports Day at the UWL versus UW Stout football game where you youth jersey for all the kids and they get in for free. Enjoy this episode. Well, on this episode of Clinically Press, we're here with Dr. Jake Erickson. He is a sports medicine physician. Uh, we are talking youth sports injuries uh, as part of our series. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to listen to the first episode, that was with Dr. Andrew Jagum talking about youth nutrition, uh, which is obviously important, and so he's got a lot of good feedback there. Uh, but today, we're, we're going to talk and focus more on just from the physician's uh, standpoint and what Dr. Erickson sees. Uh, with these injuries because yes obviously physicians are very important in the injury process but you're usually seeing them when they're officially broken right um it's not necessarily on the front end uh but that is something that you guys have been addressing through sports medicine and something we obviously at uwl take into account when we look at trying to go prevention so just wanted to get your insights and takes on it as we build up to this youth symposium um, on, on october 12th yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, speaking just initially to that backside of things, certainly as a physician, we see a lot of the injuries after they've happened, and we see them in the clinic in sports medicine, just having that relationship like we have, because we obviously work together um, professionally, getting athletes from the field or from the training room right into our clinic as efficiently as possible, make that diagnosis, get the treatment plan, and get them back on the field. And we kind of have that part nailed down for the for the most part, getting people back efficiently. Uh, but really the big picture and the purpose leading up to this symposium and all the work that we're all doing on this is to try to prevent those injuries in the first place on the front end so they don't happen. Um, one of the big things, particularly as it pertains to the, to the youth uh, population, is overuse injuries and overtraining. That can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but, but simply for us, we really try to impress upon parents and coaches in particular, paying attention to little aches and pains when they're just that, when they're just a little ache and pain. Yep. Um, if something starts out small, particularly with like a little, uh, a younger person, um, say that they're you know 12 to 14, that's a pitcher doing a lot of throwing. Um, if they start to get an ache or pain in that shoulder and that elbow, just because they are still developing, particularly with their skeleton, they're susceptible to a whole different set of injuries. Right. And so a small ache or pain in the shoulder or elbow, if you recognize that early, pay attention to it early, a day or two of rest is, is it. That's all you need to do. That ache or pain will go away. It's when we get into this scenario for a lot of different reasons, whether it's pressure from a coach, pressure from a parent, they got to play in multiple teams at the same time, they're doing multiple sports that involve overhand throwing. For various reasons, they're pushing through that pain. They're either not telling somebody because they're afraid to or they don't want to admit weakness, but they're playing through that pain. That's when a small ache or pain can turn into more stress on a structure like a tendon, a ligament, or a bone. And again, if that's pushed through too long, that can lead to a problem that takes them out of their season for a long time and unfortunately it can take things from a non-surgical issue to a surgical issue so it's really recognizing those small aches and pains early and that really needs to come from coaches and parents yeah just the more i think about it and even looking back as my own like i look at what we do with our athletes here and even at like their highest summer training volume it's maybe two and a half hours a day and that's including your weights and your um, running and all the other things you have to do and really might get just a little longer if they've got like seven on sevens. Um, I know some people have gone and taken the vantage point of it. It's not always overtraining in an older, more developed population. It's under recovering, right. which I think yeah. the more I think about it is so much more pertinent to that younger one where you know, that younger population where they go, 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 go. Like I remember in high school, I went from track practice to soccer practice Absolutely. to basketball and got up and did it again and was fine, thankfully. Um, but that's not always the case, but we don't necessarily think about 
younger kids recovering. Right. And, you know, in yeah. that. Yeah, it's super important, and as you just said, when in so many kids nowadays, like you just said, they're in school all day, they might have a gym class or phi ed class in there, and they're going to their first practice, and they may have a game, particularly if they're on multiple yep. sports. they got to eat at some point in there. They may have a designated lunch, and that might be the only time they're really eating. And so that's part of what we'll be talking about at the symposium, and that obviously that you and I talk to the parents, coaches, and the kids now is, is they got to eat, they got to be adequately fueled. Yep. And the more and more we delve into that, even when people think they're adequately fueled, they're probably still undernourishing because we are underestimating the caloric demands that these kids need, just with all the calories they're burning throughout the day, just existing, let alone right. the practices and their competitions. They're just burning up so much, and that's got to be replaced, right. particularly in that athlete. Yep, that was an eye opener when we ran that one. We talked about that with Dr. Jacob again. Worth checking out on that. Yeah. Um, when we got college athletes burning three thousand calories, if they were just to lay in bed all day, that's yeah. that's impressive. Yes. Prevention's a big thing. We've talked about that a lot. Um, there's an endless stream of screening and things you can look at. What do you see? in terms of prevention as being most effective and then also you know do you need to in theory kind of break the bank trying to get super technical with it right and i think overall and i always like your line making the complicated simple and i think really keeping it simple but again this is where parents and particularly coaches tie in early but i, I would say one of the biggest things that i think we're all in agreement on is screening for any mobility restrictions particularly with young kids, they're having growth spurts at different times. Everyone on the teammates essentially a different size and a different rate of growth, but it's not just a one-size-fits-all exercise program. Throwing young kids in, doing a complicated movement like a squat or a snatch or more of a ballistic movement, if they don't have proper mechanics and are moving appropriately, so basically if they're stiff in their joints um, or they're doing a movement improperly, adding weights or complicated movements into that really set them up for injury and we we always think about injuries happening in competition or practice Mm -hmm. they can absolutely happen in the weight room too whether that's you know an acute injury from something or just an overuse injury because they're not moving properly they're loading an area that's not moving properly that that's going to be overworked and overstressed and then that's going to lead to an injury as well so I think something simple is going through a simple mobility screen that can easily be done with school trainers, coaches can be taught that, parents can be taught that, certainly in the, you know, in the medical setting in our therapy centers and sports medicine centers, but it's just going through simple screenings to pick out things. If we identify an obvious deficiency or a movement um, pattern issue, we can do some basic corrective things to get that moving better, and that's really laying the foundation, having good range of motion, Um, good flexibility and just proper movement technique before any complicated movements are added in, certainly before any weight loading is added in, getting that foundation and then building and adding in weights from there. And if you start somebody and even if you start them over um, with getting them moving better first and then bringing in the weights, their performance and everything else is going to catch up and then exceed their, their colleagues that don't, you know, move appropriately. Yeah, that's one I've had conversations with a lot of people, you know, there's probably a bunch of ACL prevention programs out there, you know, highly technical, specialized, and people are like, you know, what's the best ACL prevention program, and I always come back to it, it's just solid, good training, like teaching the basics, and that's what I'll be trying to talk about at that symposium is, you know, here's five things that if you can address so many of the issues we commonly see by addressing these things early, like you yeah. just mentioned, and ingraining that properly, that it's only not only going to help them stay healthy, but it's also going to help increase their performance because we're getting out of them what we yes. need to get out of them and getting the right muscles loaded yep. in the proper sequence, yep. I guess, for lack of a better description, or just, yeah, basically setting them up to do better. Yep. And that's exactly right. And there are some kind of well-known ACL prevention programs that are certainly absolutely fine to use, but you hit it on the head that it's really a collection and a multifaceted approach that focuses on strength, flexibility, agility, balance, and it's really that multi-pronged approach implemented into a training program that gets that. And the nice thing is, yes, you will reduce your chances of having an ACL program. You'll also make yourself stronger. There's also good evidence that performance measures, like you just said, increase. Yep. Um, and then the nice thing, too, is a lot of those same elements translate. It's not just an ACL prevention program. It really prevents a lot of overuse injuries. Getting that lower 
um, body more stable is going to prevent overuse like patellar tendonitis commonly called runner's knee or jumper's knee which we see super common Oscar slaughters yeah all How that many stuff kids have that? can yeah. clean up and become less with a good program like this so it really just makes the person overall more fit overall a better athlete and less prone to injury both overuse and the acute big ones like an ACL tear I think it's tough because that training isn't exactly like exciting. It, yeah. it can be relatively boring, and that's hard for people, especially in the days of social media and what's the latest exercise on yep. Instagram or yep. who's jumping up to a 60-inch box or something yep. like that. Yep. Um, but I've made the argument, and I haven't worked directly with collegiate or high school kids or younger, but just looking at what we have at UWL, like, if we can get basic patterns, and we, I mean, we, every January start off with teaching our football guys how to land, how to jump, hop, and land, and do it properly, yeah. and then it's sprint technique, and, you know, driving your knees, and we don't get super complex yeah. until later in July, as we're getting close, but I think you see the results across a much bigger scale and you can have that effect even though it's not as cool as some yep. of the Instagram yep. stuff. And I think you've got it figured out really nicely too where you incorporate a lot of that corrective training if you will and kind of ACL based and style of prevention incorporating that into their warm ups and some of their training and so yep. it's just kind of built in the athlete per se doesn't even really know specifically what or why necessarily that they're doing that for. It's just part of their programming, but it's intelligent programming that's built in with the purpose. So it's just really the most efficient way to get it done. It's just all built in there. It's not, okay, we got to stop what we're doing for our sport specific training. Now it's ACL prevention time right. or performance time. It's just all in there. The yeah, extra 30 minute go. stretching session that nobody's really paying attention yeah. to. Yeah. They're all talking and the whole, you know, throw your arm over and just, yep. Yes, stretched out. So, and then particularly as we talk to young athletes, and as you just said too, um, you know, people always come in and you know, how are these professional athletes and really high-level college athletes? How are they? You know, they're never missing much time. You know, what are they doing? And I think people forget that they really have daily access to trainers. They're essentially doing daily therapy and working on this stuff every day, uh, whereas it's much more difficult to have that type of exposure for your you know everyday you know person walking around, or certainly a high school athlete doesn't have that level of exposure. Um, but it's really that constant daily working on those mechanics and movement patterns and if they do have an injury, rehabbing it every day, not just kind of toughing it out. That's one we talk about because uh, we use the injury prevention term, but then people can, well, I got hurt still. Like, how is it? So we've thrown out the uh, injury resilience too, where yeah. if you do get injured because things happen, it's part of the game. That's why a lot of us have jobs and yeah. uh, job security. Exactly. But we've also seen people get back faster because they're already in a good spot that yes something happened sure but their body is already advanced to where we can actually get them back in theory quicker right you know, where we can have hamstrings that are back in two weeks instead of six or you know whatever it may be yeah um just because they've had some adaptation which i think is you know important to realize sure. with it, that it's not a hundred percent preventable yes and speaking to that too, and obviously again at the college level, a lot more resources, a lot more access, certainly than the, compared to the high school level. But that's why we're kind of doing this type of symposium, but want to be talking to coaches and certainly mm -hmm. um, weight room type coaches in the high school because it's it's learning those patterns, getting those movement patterns ingrained at an early age, and so that by the it's not that they're getting to college and now okay let's try to redo everything, let's try to. Right start over from ground zero, which does happen, but it it's really makes a big difference to get that adaptations at an earlier age. And I think the big call to action there is really at the high school administrative level and then coaches and weight room style coaches to just be open. You know, we know that people are, are very smart and are good at their roles, but um, you know, we're all lifelong learners. I think that's a little easier for us to say um, in medicine and around sports, but just having those people be open to having people come in and maybe just provide some additional education, show a little different perspective, show mm -hmm. kind of what some of the latest and greatest techniques and patterns are, to not to overhaul a high school program, but just to add to it and maybe make it more efficient. <coughs> and then again, the proof's in the pudding, and once some <coughs> of these programs get started and people start seeing that their kids are moving better, I think is a big win. And then I think just another mindset, particularly at the high school level, 
one way that we judge people how they're doing, particularly in a weight room setting, is how much weight are you moving? You come yeah. in at January, this is what your numbers are, and we check your numbers later. I think really getting a different process like is seen at the college and professional levels is how are you moving through that weight? What is your speed? What does your form look like? Because that's really, it's that form and that movement and how you're using the body that translates probably a lot better to the competition field to yep. sports than a pure number on a bar. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot. You know, what's 10 pounds off your squat max, but you feel 10% better yep. versus that extra 10 pounds, but your knees hurt or yep. something else hurts, and it, it's just not worth it in the long run Absolutely. for most of them. You know, we can, especially in season, you know, let's be smart about it. Yeah. Uh, but we've looked at that with some of ours, and it's just, you got to look at the cost benefit and... Yeah, 10 pounds on your squat max really isn't going to make a big difference absolutely out on any certain quarter yep. field or whatever it may be yep. and then another theme too would just be to, a different way to think about it that's that's all already done but particularly at the younger levels again is is training with a purpose you know what are you training for yep. your high school if it's a specific sport or if it's for the military or just general fitness you know you have a goal so that you're training and then also that recovery which comes in with time off sleep nutrition that it's all done with a purpose to yep. enhance what you're doing because the whole purpose of you know, the weight room is more obvious but if you're a football player depending on your position you need to jump higher better agility this type of thing you know the pure numbers on the bar don't necessarily make a difference it's all that other stuff how you're moving through the how you're recovering and your adequate rest too yeah you bring up a good point that it's it, training is a process it's not just picking a workout or going in Absolutely. and hitting three sets of ten yeah every week for the entire year like you gotta build in some variety up and down you know in terms of your intensities absolutely allow the body to recover absolutely because that's can be hard and because people want to work hard and they want to you know i'm going to outwork people and i fully understand it and respect it but yeah at at what end to what cost is the one that we always got to keep in mind yep um with those and with uh younger people too with parents and coaches um obviously they're around a lot of practices and games one of the things we can see and again, just going back to the initial conversation, kids in school all day, lots of practices, yep. they're tired. Um, if they start seeing during competition drops in performance, whether they're not running as fast, they're not throwing as hard or as fast, the parent just notices something's a little off, you know, pull them aside and chat with them because a drop in performance may be an early sign or even a later sign, but just a sign that you know something's off, they're tired, they're fatigued. That's not a time to be pushing through that or going through the motions. That's a time to take a little break, right. um, whether that be from training or a game or something, just to recover. Because if they take that day or two again to recover, regroup, refresh, they're going to come back a lot closer to 100% than if they just keep pushing through that. Oh, more, absolutely. more times you keep pushing through things, that just wears on the body, more susceptible to injuries, but then just burnout, just general lack of enjoyment too. You know, A lot of this is physical stuff that is an injury to the body, this, that, and the other, which is obviously front and center but just the mental aspect that just the grind of being in school all day, the grind of practice, the grind of competition, the grind of traveling, it, it's a lot for a young developing body and a young developing mind. And if they get burned out, they lose interest, even just for that year, but that may affect them the rest of their life. They may say, you know what, this was just so much that they all of a sudden become more sedentary that goes beyond their sport, goes right. beyond high school, and that sets them up for the rest of their life. So. It's a really a complex thing, but you know that's why we're talking about it. That's why we want to educate about it. Uh, that it's it's just a multifaceted approach to keep uh, people healthy, keep them moving better, prevent injuries, treat injuries efficiently when they happen, but then still keeping the joy and overall enjoyment in this because it goes way beyond you know high school, middle school, and college sports. That they what we want to set people up for an active life through their sporting career. There's a great foundation to talk and learn about all this, absolutely. But we also want to set them up for fun, active lives with minimal pain. For sure. Any other topics you want to hit on in this one? If not, I've got one comp- one question at the end. I think just and not to be doom and gloom, but a big part of the prevention aspect is an injury sustained at a young age. ACL is a common injury, but a, a big injury at a young age, even when you get through that injury, so to speak, and back to things, that injury has lifelong implications. So, for instance, an ACL injury, uh, the majority of people within 10 to 20 years will develop arthritis of that joint. So if you're 18 years old when that happens, you know, you're in your 40s with arthritis of your knee, and that's going to have implications on your lifestyle at an early age. 
you know, just all the more reason to take this stuff seriously and, and make you know make it a point to, to actually you know pursue some of this stuff as a, as a collective whole. That's us as medical providers, uh, as parents, coaches, and the athletes themselves. We all got to come together for just the overall good of these young kids. Perfect. So the last question you already kind of alluded to it, but we asked um, everybody is. Um, how would you take something that is seemingly complicated, in this case, you know, youth sports injuries, and try and make that simple in terms of how you would relay that? And I think, kind of summarizing, I, I really think just because the people that have the most face time and we always look to the schools, particularly as we talk about high school, and that's going to come from coaches, athletic directors, and then your strength and conditioning coaches. And just trying to have open conversations. You know, everybody, you know, is very smart in doing what they do, but just working together that, you know, take the egos out of it, that, you know, this way has worked for 20 years. Keep people open to the idea that, boy, if we can screen people, get them moving better, not focusing so much on weights and numbers, making sure that there's joy and fun in this. You know, we get it, it's competitive and everybody wants to win, but it's got to be, it's got to have joy in it and always think about the long haul. I think we cannot forget that, that, you know, pushing through injuries at the high school level certainly is just really not a good idea because if we're not going to go on and have a career in professional sports and you do something else, if you've got a knee that hurts you every day of your life and limits your ability down the road to play with your own kids and grandkids, you know, it's, it's hard to see that for the, for the high school kid. They can't think that far. We can't expect them to think that far. So we got to do it for them. We can't be pushing them and certainly pressuring them to do it. So I think it really just comes from an open dialogue because it takes a multi-pronged team with physicians, with trainers, with all the people that we've mentioned to just work together. And I think it starts with education this and open dialogue that the overall arching theme is to keep kids moving better, pain-free, and having fun while doing it. I like it. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Stay tuned. we got more episodes coming out as we lead up to this thing. Uh, but thank you for listening, and we will catch you at the next episode. Thank you for checking out this episode of Clinically Pressed. Go to clinicallypressed.com for full show notes and links to everything that we covered in this episode. While you're there, you'll have full access to all our episodes, insights, and shorts. You can find Clinically Pressed on YouTube or any podcast outlet that you use. If you could give us a rating, thumbs up, or a review on how we're doing, we would greatly appreciate it and heard it helps out quite a bit. To get more free content delivered straight to your inbox, sign up for the Total Athletic Therapy newsletter at totalathletictherapy.com or clinicallypressed.com. You'll get direct links to all the new Clinically Pressed episodes, reviews on some of the latest research in health and performance, and links to related podcasts and other items meant to help you make the complicated, simple, and optimized performance. Thank you for listening, and see you next episode.